So my name is Kelly Welsh. I'm a renal dietitian and PKD patient myself. Yeah, so I'm Dr. Jacob Torres. I'm a researcher at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and work in the Wines Lab. I'm currently also the Renew Program Coordinator. So we're geez, every day with all types of PKD patients. I'm also a researcher for Santa Barbara Nutrients. You know, you might be familiar with us. <laughs> you know, our lab helped design the Renew program. Yeah. And based off of research I've done in the lab over the about 13 years now. So uh, I've been doing PKD all that entire time. Uh, we're doing research on it. And yeah, hopefully I can answer some questions today that are, everyone wants to know about. One interesting thing with PKD is that some are prone to kidney stones and some are not. Something that goes hand in hand with PKD I mean, are kidney stones a result of having PKD? Is that one of the side effects necessarily? It seems like it. The people, you know, individuals that have polycystic kidney disease have a higher incidence of kidney stones. I think that there's a few different mechanisms why that's the case. I think that there's partially because polycystin 1 is involved in calcium sensation and it's a calcium channel. So that being disrupted it could have many different effects. It could have a lot of effects on a mineral handling. It's also known that in a lot of these mouse models of PKD that they have inappropriate mineral handling as well. My recent paper that just came out, we were looking at uh, mineral handling of the hand rat, which is a non-orthologous polycystic model. And that rat has uh, inappropriate calcium excretion, what we found as well. And so it seems as though just the PKD itself is responsible for some of this inappropriate mineral handling. It's likely that that's part of the issue is that there's just some problems with the minerals being where they're not supposed to be at certain times. And also there are effects on the gut microbiome that could be causing that as well. That's a big part of kidney stone formation. You have things in your gut that are that eat up a lot of the compounds that could eventually form kidney stones. And that's another thing that we don't know a whole lot about, but it seems to be something that people are missing in their gut that lead them to form kidney stones as well. Specifically sure. oxalate of uh, kidney stones. I was just going to say, so oxalate and managing, right? I mean, that was that's kind of a new word in the last few years that people have never really looked at before and the importance of managing. And I use the word managing because a lot of people come in and think that they have to eliminate all oxalates in their diet. And, and, and that's really tough because oxalates are in almost every plant source we eat. So, you know, we talk about having a calcium source on board. We talk about limiting the really high sources like spinaches and almond and almond products, which makes it hard when we start talking about diet, which we will because almond and almond flour seems to be in every thing that we're not supposed to have. But yes, it's excellent management for sure. Um, and then of course, purines, another type of kidney stone. Uh, let's see. Was pho phosphate is the other big one as well. Yeah, so I think those are yes. the, yeah, phosphate, oxalate, and uric acid are kind of the predominant kidney stones you'll see. There's some other more minor ones formed from magnesium, and they all kind of mix and match their ion partners depending on the pH and concentration. So you can get different types. Those are the predominant, though, the, the uric acid, um, oxalate, and calcium phosphate. Those are the ones you see the most of, and they're just dependent on the pH for the most part.